So the Seville project, uh, given that not many of you heard about it, I will talk a little bit about it. So after the Haiti earthquake, um, I remember the, the rawness of the moment uh, of sitting in the car and, sort of, and hearing about it and being mindful, uh, as I imagine a number of us are, that when a society loses communications capability, that law and order actually disintegrates uh, within a few days uh, from that. Once the bad guys realise that the good guys can't call each other up and you know, uh, turn up to, uh, to chase them, um, the bad guys realise that they can do pretty much whatever they want. And so this, this is kind of in my mind, I thought, oh, look, the, you know, I knew that the mobile phone network was substantially knocked out. I thought, oh, well, look, you know, they'll be able to, uh, to you know, fly in gear and you know, they'll have funky guys in uh, greener khaki than I'm wearing, uh, rolling up big shipping containers and goodness knows what and, and putting stuff back together. So I'm thinking this happily to myself when the, uh, the person uh, on the radio then said, oh, and the airport... Uh, has been destroyed by the, uh, uh, the earthquake. There is one functioning runway and it's taking one flight in or out every half an hour uh, with air traffic control out of Florida, i.e. from another country. Um, so I thought, okay, uh, if I want to make myself feel uh, better that things are going to be okay for the, uh, the Haitian people, uh, that that really wasn't going to cut the mustard. So I thought, okay, well, they can drive in. Uh, Haiti, unlike Australia, is connected to another country by road. And so they could kind of, you know, it would take a little bit longer, but it would still do it in time. Uh, you know, truck gear in from uh, the Dominican Republic and get everything patched up and, and working again. So I'm, you know, having a renewed sense of uh, having escaped from having to face the reality of what was happening there. Um, when the person on the radio then said, and practically every road in Haiti has actually been turned to rubble. Um, and if you've seen the pictures, they indeed very effectively were turned to rubble. Uh, so I'm sitting there in the car thinking, hmm, okay, I'm going to have to try harder if I want to in my rich, white, wealthy uh, position uh, to find a way to not feel so bad about their situation. And so I remember thinking, okay, it'll take a little bit longer again, but they can fill up a cargo ship uh, in the harbour of uh, Dominican Republic and basically do a three-point turn around the, uh, the point and pull into uh, to Port-au-Prince Harbour. I'm thinking, oh, what a wonderful uh, person I am that I can think of ways to uh, not feel so bad about their, uh, their situation. Um, as I'm thinking this to myself, uh, the person on the radio says, and the harbour has collapsed. And I just remember the rawness of that moment of thinking, you know, all of my resourcefulness about feeling better uh, has been exhausted. And, uh, and just thinking, being forced to think more deeply about uh, what was going to happen uh, and, and just the, the apprehension about what was so very likely to happen for the Haitian people. And uh, unfortunately, as I had confirmed talking to uh, uh, various relief organisations uh, later on, indeed happened. There was really nasty stuff and sort of, you know, you'd, they'd be driving from one hospital to another and go, oh, look, how wonderful, a government checkpoint to make sure that we're all fine and safe. No. That checkpoint is not operated by the government. It's operated by whoever it is happens to have a big enough gun and they just rack through your car and grab what they want. And if your car is better than their car, then maybe they do a swap seat with the car or maybe you know, they're, they're short of a Hilux and so you get to you know, drive off in your air car uh, afterwards. Um, so there was all of this kind of stuff uh, going on. And so it just got me thinking like, yeah, like this does not need to happen. This should not happen. And then I got thinking about, well, why does it happen? And it's this whole, the, the fragility of uh, communications, uh, mobile communications in particular. And so then I started thinking, well, this totally should never happen ever again. And so uh, as one often does with grandiose ideas, I initially started thinking, okay, like, you know, assuming no roads, no airport, um, no harbour, how can we kind of get phone towers back up? And so I sort of had these great, uh, you know, concepts of, you know, flying C-130 Hercules, uh, C Hercules over uh, Haiti or somewhere in need and pushing out sort of half shipping container things that basically then sort of land on the ground and transformer-like turn into a phone tower and then sort of mesh amongst themselves. And this was a wonderful idea. Um, and the irony is it's probably easy to get funding for something like that in some ways because um, it costs a fortune and, you know, the, the whole industrial complex can make a lot of money out of it. Um, but then what occurred to me, in fact, was we didn't need to. The things that we all carry around in our pockets physically are capable of communicating any way we like. It's only the fact that they are effectively uh, captive uh, and just the mind 
mindset of the carriers is captive to this infrastructure dependent model. If you think about carriers, uh, they have two natural monopolies. Um, one is on big piles of cash to build stuff, and it's not quite a monopoly, but it's, you know, I don't think any of us here probably have three to four billion dollars uh, handy to, uh, uh, to roll out the next open source project. Um, if you do, please let me know. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's Spectrum and the regulation and the licenses uh, that are the other natural monopoly and, uh, and their infrastructure based on that. And so anything which undermines the ability, uh, sorry, yeah, that undermines that natural monopoly and lets phones talk uh, without using phone towers um, is naturally of uh, no interest at best to the carriers. Uh, and if they're feeling particularly paranoid, um, is actually you know something that they would want to stop. And so it's not surprising that um, mobile phones uh, haven't really been blessed with the means to communicate directly. I mean, in the 20th century, we had walkie-talkies, and we could kind of yabber away for free, and you know, and do all of those wonderful things that we could. And we now have something which is much more capable than a walkie-talkie, and yet we can't even do with it what we used to be able to do with a walkie-talkie. And so some of this is what we try to solve with the several project. And so we have uh, been getting these phones to mesh using ad hoc Wi-Fi, which has a whole pile of uh, difficulties with it. Partly you need to root phones on Android. Um, you know, uh, iOS doesn't have full support for ad hoc. Windows Mobile doesn't have full support. Um, Symbian does. Unfortunately, uh, Nokia uh, appear to have uh, gone with uh, Windows Mobile instead. And so it's kind of, well, what do we do about this? And so then it got me thinking, well, we should get some custom mobile phones made that have an Arduino in the back of it, and hence we start getting on to the, uh, the main theme of this talk. And then we can put an, any ra um, uh, radio front end we like on it. So we could, for instance, put a 900 megahertz um, ISM band, so it's another band like 2.4 gig for Wi-Fi, down at 900 megs. It's uh, free to use in a bunch of countries, including here in Australia. Um, the irony, of course, is the radio and the main phone could actually talk on that band, but uh, extracting the secret information out of the, uh, the chipset vendors to reprogram that is a, a very difficult process. So it's much easier to go to a, uh, you know, a cheap Chinese phone manufacturer. Uh, for a few hundred thousand dollars, we can probably get a phone design that has a, uh, an Arduino port in the back, and then we can plug whatever radios we like in the back. It's then all open source from that end, and we can start writing the, uh, the software we need to make use of that. And the, uh, sorry, yes, a question? Uh, Android already has an accessory development toolkit that is based on Android, that's based on Arduino. Yes, so, that, so the, the comment here is that uh, Android already has an accessory kit that is based on Android. And so you have a, this a thing that you have to basically plug into the phone. So you kind of, you know, you want to make a phone call, and it's like, like the, the magic trick, you're pulling out endless stuff. Um, and from memory, the accessory port has to be powered. The accessory has to be powered, I think. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so it, it, it has to be powered. Um, so you, yeah, you sort of you, know, you pull out the device and then you pull out the battery thing on the end and then you pull out your, your cord that's plugged into the wall uh, potentially to, to run it. So um, it, and it, it is a solution, but the right solution we think is actually to say, well, yeah, it, it's pretty easy to get one of these modified kind of spare SPI interface, attach that to an Arduino. Uh, and there's already sort of some open source uh, devices out there, like little open WRT routers that uh, that have this kind of capability in there. So the, the, the technical risks are really low. And so then we can uh, put that in. The server mesh protocols already support using uh, low bandwidth uh, interfaces. So it's just a case of writing the, uh, the tie-ins for that and doing some optimization and, uh, and polishing work on that. Uh, and we potentially can actually have communications uh, without, depending on Wi-Fi, without needing to route the phone. And you know this, this is really nice, and, and the range potentially is 16 to 32 times what Wi-Fi would get with the kind of you know little itty bitty uh, radios. I think might fish one out of the bag after, but they're basically sort of you know about an inch and a half long and uh, say 30 mils long and 20 mils wide or so, and about five mils thick. They're they're really quite small. Um, and the other nice thing is that it means that you can change the radio based on which country you're in. If you're in a country with a regime, <coughs> pardon me, uh, who take issue with you wanting to communicate with your people around you to protect yourselves against militia and goodness knows what, um, and they start jamming your favourite frequency, well actually you can just replace the module with a different one on a different frequency. Um, and you know, we're just allowing that innovation uh, to occur. So um, we think there is tremendous value in that and of itself. But then, I was thinking about that, thinking, well, actually, two things. One, I don't really want to compete with Huawei and Samsung and Apple and all the rest of it on handsets. I mean, um, if, for instance, you know, we got a, a nice little phone like this made with an Arduino in the back, um, and you, know, you have to pick a price point, so say you know, we go for the lower end to make it more affordable, who here is willing to use a low-end Android phone as a daily phone? 
Two people, three people, four people, four do we have four, five? Five people, excellent, five down the back. Sold. Um, the vast majority of you, however, are not. This is totally understandable. So what we realised actually is we can actually make it cheaper again by not making it a phone, but actually just making it a mesh helper device. So ditch the expensive screen, could probably actually go for a slower processor um, and put a bigger battery in there where the screen was and it can operate as a Wi-Fi access point as an ad hoc mesh node so it can peer local range to themselves at high speed and then has the Arduino port so you can do the long range meshing uh, in there, sorry, yes? Basically, like, like open the door, you know, with the board for an uh, Arduino, but with a battery. Yes, that's right. So, so we're basically talking, yeah, like a, an open word uh, device with an Arduino that is battery powered and can fit in your pocket. Yep, and, and with the, the right firmware on it. Absolutely. In fact, the way we're prototyping it is, in fact, actually with a TP Link WR703N um, $22.3 watt uh, unit. That's actually going to be a really nice way to, uh, uh, to prototype it. Um, so, this is all wonderful. And I think that that actually has profound implications. Once we can do meshing over kilometric ranges, um, suddenly we actually have a, a really useful capability that uh, I think actually eclipses uh, what CB radios used to be able to do. Because we can do multi-hops, so we can extend the range beyond that uh, you know, sort of kilometric distance. We can do text, we can do file exchanges. We demonstrated earlier this morning, we can actually update our own mesh software over the mesh uh, using our store and forward file exchange uh, system. Um, so that, that's all fantastic, and we then realised a step further. When you go to hospitals and clinics, and you look at uh, all of the, a lot of the, the various medical doohicks, um, to use a technical term, um, they're, they're typically a box of blinking lights um, that plugs into the wall that has a battery in it, that has a processor, and probably has some signal processing capability in it. it has a bit of a screen and some buttons, or a, a increasingly touch interfaces and all of these things. Um, and then it has a port that plugs onto a curly cord that has some interesting thing that you know, they, they poke in odd places or you know, put your finger to measure uh, blood um, oxygen levels and the like. And what we realise actually is if we make this mesh helper device, it's actually not just a mesh helper device, it's actually commoditising the box of blinking lights for a whole class of medical devices potentially. So you, you, know, you might have a $200 tablet with a nice big screen uh, for interfacing to it. You then have the helper device that's plugged into the curly cord that then maybe is monitoring someone's uh, you know, pulse and, uh, and oxygen levels in their blood. And it can use the mesh, say if we're in a developing country where there's no good network infrastructure in the hospital, uh, the mesh can actually be reporting back to a nurse's station to say, you know, patient N is stable, they're within the alarm ranges of pulse. It can alarm if the, uh, the mesh communications fails or if it, it goes out of alarm levels. Um, and that, I think, actually has profound potential impact uh, around the world. Obviously in developing countries it means that instead of a $2,000 pulse oximeter, or actually the cheapest decent ones are about 250 bucks, you could potentially have, you know, when uh, someone was saying earlier today you can get phones much like this in Coles at the moment for $49. Um, and then, you know, the mesh helper device, I, I would like to think that you know, it can be, you know, uh, under $100. And then you can already buy spare parts for most of these boxes of blinking lights um, because the curly cords break and the little things on the end break. And so you, you can I mean, go into Alibaba one day and see all of the interesting medical um, attachments that you can buy um, at alarmingly cheap prices in uh, quantities ranging from one to 400,000, um, which is probably not the best way to buy Band-Aids, but anyway. Um, so, have you got kids? Yes, we do have kids. <laughs> and that's probably the best. Yeah, one. unfortunately, <laughs> you've got 400,000 Dora band aids, and then by the time you, you know, you've got through the first eight of them, suddenly they want, I don't know, Buzz Lightyear ones or something. So it's, that's when you cover them in them. Yeah, so we need to get them like with those uh, Optima keyboards with the, uh, the active LED displays. <laughs> so you can change the band aid appearance for them. Um, <laughs> and that's a whole interesting marketing opportunity, isn't it? Um, meanwhile, back at the point <laughs> of making cheap boxes of blinking lights. So we can probably already undercut the price of the best, cheapest, you know, worthwhile pulse oximeter. Um, and then, you know, with a bit more software development and a, another a little bit of work, we could have a fetal heart rate monitor. Um, you can already buy the spare parts for those for like $30 or $40, something like that. Um, and then you go, well, an imaging ultrasound machine. Well, the, 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 you know, the big things, you know, if you're having kids or whatever and they go in and you, know, you get to see the kid, and you go, oh, this is all wonderful. And you go, this is an enormous box that must cost a fortune. You go, hang on a minute. 
it's an ultrasound, like it's an ultrasonic transponder on the end of a curly cord that needs some signal processing, needs a pretty screen, needs some battery backup, needs some way for an operator to input into it. And there's a, a group in the UK who are making um, ultrasound probes now uh, for that kind of, that can be used for that kind of thing, uh, for 40 quid. So you go, okay, 40 quid, so what is it, $60 or something, I and mean, depending you know, dollar keeps going up. It's, when you operate on research grants, it's very annoying that our dollar is high. I need our, our dollar to go through the floor every time we get a grant payment through uh, from overseas. It would be very welcome. So if anyone's into uh, currency manipulation, just to let me know. Um, but meanwhile... You can't build a small device on it. We have a small device. Yeah, so we're trying to control their brain waves. Um, but anyways, you go, okay, $60 for an imaging ultrasound probe. Um, say $40 for the, uh, the fetal heart rate monitor. And you go, but hang on a minute, wait, there's more. The imaging ultrasound probe, you could operate it in single channel mode and actually use it as a fetal heart rate monitor. Totally easy to do. So, okay, $60, uh, $10 for the pulse oxy probe. There's a group in India who have just made a pulse oxy heme sensor using six LEDs. So no pinprick, and they can tell whether you've got anemia or not. Um, and at the moment, that's proprietary. If anyone's interested in board and uh, would like to do an interesting PhD project, I'd love to make an open source one of those. Um, let me know. Our department has biomedical engineering and us open source mob in the same place. Um, so you go, okay, you know, what is it? So $60, $70, $80 plus, say, $70 for the, uh, the helper device plus another you know, $50 for the phone. Suddenly you've got something that you can hold in one hand that replaces a $50,000 imaging ultrasound machine, um, a $1,000 fetal heart rate monitor, and a $200 to $2,000 pulse oximeter. Um, did you know in the developing world that every year half a million women die in childbirth for a variety of reasons. Another half a million are severely disabled in the process. So basically, it's a million women a year. And that's not counting you know, the, the little lives that are, are lost or impact in that process. One of the leading causes in that is actually anemia. Um, undetected anemia. So then when there's blood loss during childbirth, it gets to critically low levels and, uh, and complications set in. Um, if we could equip you know, every midwife going through deepest, darkest Africa and wherever else with a couple of hundred dollars worth of gear that would let them do a whole pile of diagnostic checks. Even if they don't have the skills to interpret the results, the mesh can carry the data back and synchronise it into the clinic when they walk back into the clinic. Um, so, you know, we, we can carry the, the data uh, on foot. That is disruptive. That is disruptive not merely economically, it's disruptive in terms of development, of equity of opportunity, of lives. It's disruptive of society in a really positive way. And that is why Arduino-enabled um, phones or mesh helper devices is something that we totally, totally uh, need to see. And we've talked to a few places. The, like, to, to actually prototype the hardware of the device, one to three hundred thousand um, dollars to write the software to you know to start using it for the mesh. I don't know if you said of you know the order of a million dollars worth of effort, but with the open source community, we can probably crowdsource pile of that uh, development effort and get that cost down. But even if for the moment we said you know it's say one and a half million to do those two tasks, and then you know those three medical devices, the imaging ultrasound would be the hardest one because. You know, we kind of need some really clever math bods and some time and effort to, uh, to do it. But I mean, hey, there's been gazillions of imaging ultrasound machines made in the world. It, it, you know, it, it's totally practicable. Let's say it costs another $5 million to make um, you know, that suite of three uh, you know, attachments that you could make for it. So for a few million dollars, we actually have the opportunity to really transform the way that uh, healthcare is provided in the developing world. And actually, I think there's a really good economic argument here in the developed world as well. Um, you look at uh, the number of older people who would dearly love to stay living in their own homes and actually having um, freedom and quality of life rather than actually being um, prisoners of society's conscience. We are worried about old people having a fall in their own home. We never, or very rarely, actually think to ask them and say, here is the trade-off. If you stay living in your own home, you may have a fall and your quality of life may be curtailed sharply at some point. 
um, or we can put you into a, a supported care where your quality of life in all likelihood will actually be severely curtailed immediately um, and let them make that informed choice. It's actually usually fearful medical practitioners making that choice. Sometimes it's fearful family members uh, who are not aware of any alternatives. But the bottom line is, if we could save, you know, if we could defer the age at which people went into supported care by a year, in Australia and the US alone, it would probably save something of the order of three to four billion dollars a year. So the economic argument, I think, is actually totally there. Um, just looking at that, so ignoring the fact that we actually we really have this kind of moral obligation to actually help the developing world and people in rural and remote areas. Who's ever needed to use a flying doctor? Anyone here ever needed to use a flying doctor? People here aware of what the flying doctor service is? It, who's not aware of what the flying doctor service is? Yeah, a couple of people. So, so here in Australia, we are extremely fortunate. We actually have, I think it's officially the world's oldest uh, flying doctor service because basically we've got, what is it, eight and a half million square kilometres, 22 million people. Uh, when it was set up, I think our national population was about four million people. So it was one person per two square kilometres. And most of that, of course, is, you know, is on the, the, the edge of the pie crust around the, uh, the coast. And so we, we recognised that we had this need to, uh, uh, to help people in need uh, in the interior. Um, and I think actually it was 1996 that the US finally got something like this. Um, and we've had it for uh, 100 years or thereabouts now. Um, and it's primarily actually been publicly funded, as in like by the public, not by the government. Uh, I think there's a bit of a, a mix uh, in with that now. Uh, amazing that they can actually get to anywhere in the country in two hours. Uh, think about the logistics of that when there's uh, no airstrips covering six million square kilometres of the country. But anyway, um, so I, I think... There is this compelling opportunity. I think a well-structured Kickstarter campaign could totally fund the first two stages easily. And then once you have the first two stages, then you, know, you might hit Kickstarter again or go to the Gates Foundation or one of these others and say, hey, we can change the world. It's only going to cost this much and it will actually return a profit in the sales of gear um, and a massive social profit. So this really is why I think Arduino enabled uh, phones is a critical thing that we need to do and we'd love anyone's help that would like to, uh, to partner uh, in making that a reality with us. Thank you. Questions? So, if anybody has a question, sure. Um, what do you think about the uh, Tricorder X Prize? Uh, the Tricorder X Prize, uh, we've looked at it and it looks very interesting and I think it's the kind of thing that this kind of concept would have the potential to win, although the Tricorder X Prize is specifically focused around having a doohick that can diagnose, uh, which is actually much harder than just being able to measure and convey the data back to a, a healthcare provider. So what we're proposing is the low-hanging fruit uh, between here and the X Prize. In actual fact, it's, it's really actually the, the, like the bulk of the value, I would actually argue, is in getting this first stage and then the, uh, having the automatic diagnosis uh, just provides further savings uh, beyond that. Yes? Who was commenting the whole space of these kind of portable, low cost, personal clinical instruments is exploding. There's, there's, every, every month or so there's a new announcement that someone's produced a new thing that you just hold to your temple and it tells you the state of health or a new thing that puts on your finger or so. The chap in India has done the, um, an India detection. It just, it's just rolling. You know, every, so many people are working on, on this mm. independently, you know, scratching their own niches or as it were. Yeah, and so cause I'm not sure whether that will have picked up on the microphone. So the, the comment is basically that you know, the hard medical hardware attachments for phones are coming at an increasing rate. And so really what we're talking about is, is pushing the, the cost of that down because most of them actually come out for iPhone. The iPhone costs four times as much on its own as what we could potentially provide a suite of medical attachments. And it's not really easy for your average person to innovate on the hardware on the iPhone. You kind of need to, you know, to do the whole, you know, get the blessing of Steve Jobs ghost and all of that kind of stuff to, uh, to do it. What we want to do is make a device, you know, it's an open source Arduino based thing. We want people to say, hey, we can make this thing that we think can measure blood pressure, you know, whatever the, the thing is that it can do. Um, and then, you know, they can publish the results of that and then you know, a medical device company might say, hey, we're going to look at that, we're going to do the rigorous testing, we'll do the certification and get it to market. Or it might be that, you know, through Kickstarter campaigns, it actually gets done in a totally open source kind of way. I'd, I'd love to see health go open source because the current um, financially vested monopoly basis of, um, of healthcare um, 
doesn't work. I mean, you look in the US where it's at its most extreme. In the US, they spend on average, uh, a few years ago these figures are from, 14% of their GDP goes on health care. Here in Australia, where we have, uh, I think they would call it a, a, a communist, um, socialist and fascist all at the same time, um, uh, I think because we have a national health care system, oh, that's right, we, we send our grandmothers to death boards as well, I believe, was uh, uh, what the Republicans were arguing as well. Um, nonetheless, we spend 6 to 7% of our national GDP on health care. And uh, anyone who's wandered around the US, I mean, the, the state of health of people there for what they get for their 14% versus here, particularly if you're not in the wealthy bracket, it, it, it works a whole lot better when these things are not captive to, uh, to commercial interests. Interest, the, um, the US-Australia free, free Trade Agreement, the US health companies tried to get our PBS basically banned, so our pharmaceutical benefit scheme where we subsidise uh, medications. And the reason they don't like it is because we apply a threefold test. The thing has to be at least uh, as good, if not better, than uh, the, the previous medication in that category. Um, it's like the, the military thing. So it has to be better accepted and it has to not cost more or has to ideally actually cost less. And they, they don't like competing on the basis of, uh, of benefit. They like to be able to, to run ads uh, and convince on the basis of marketing, which is, of course, a parasitic cost in the whole thing. And uh, the, the ad part is probably actually counts for 2 or 3% of that GDP alone. Uh, I would suspect. I don't have the, the figures to back that up, but it's my suspicion. All right, we've actually run out of time for questions now. Um, so, applause.